Good evening. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to end this inspiring evening with a look back into our past. Now, archaeology deals with all kinds of material remains from the past, and classical archaeology in particular focuses on the ancient Mediterranean, on the Greek and Roman cultures, including those they interacted with. Now, while literary sources help us understand the Greek and Roman perspectives on these cultural encounters, the voices of the other players involved often remain obscure to us because they didn't leave any texts. Fortunately, however, we do not only communicate with words, and that is why I chose to work with images to explore the role of visual languages in these cultural interactions. What comes to your mind when you think of Greek antiquity? Temples? Statues? Marble? The Aegean is rich in marble and limestone, and this may well have contributed to the fact that sculpture became such an important, if not defining, element of Greek visual language. Since the beginnings of its monumentalization in the Archaic period, and that was roughly between 700 and 500 BCE, to give you an idea of where we are, it began to be used as a social tool. It allowed members of social groups to inscribe themselves, to inscribe their images into public memory. Such as Isias, son of Rhesus, who devoted this huge five and a half meters high statues in the sanctuary of Hera at Samos. Their images were also set up as tombstones, such as this one, the image of a woman called Frasicleia, who, as the inscription tells us, died a maiden before her marriage, and she was buried and mourned in a graveyard in Attica. But can we assume that sculpture played the same important and defining role for other cultures as well? Well, it obviously did not for the Thracians and Scythians, whom the Greeks encountered in the Western and Northern Black Sea, the area that I have specialized in during the past years. While they had other means of communication, actually they preferred other image carriers too. They put their images on metal items. And while Greek arts, from its very beginning, was a very figurative art, embracing the human body, Scythians refrained from displaying the human figure almost entirely. Animals, on the other hand, show up in their images so frequently that we even speak of the Scythian animal style. So how did these different concepts get in touch with each other? In fact, the first Greek settlements in the Black Sea go back to the 7th century BCE. That people left their hometowns, mostly in the eastern Mediterranean, had various reasons. External pressure could play a role, internal conflicts, rivalry between peers, but also aspects like access to resources, to particular materials, to technologies or to partners. Personally, I don't believe it's a coincidence that many of the earliest and of the most successful of these settlements were founded in geographically connective areas, alongside straits such as the Chimerian Bosporus, or in estuaries of big rivers, like the delta of the Danube or the Dnieper Buk Liman. And even though these settlements, at least in their beginnings, looked somewhat different from what we know in Greece, and it's still in many cases in debate how mixed their populations actually was, we can observe that they celebrated a Greek way of life. We encounter Greek names, we encounter a lot of Greek pottery, and we also encounter marble sculpture. But how did such works get there? Were they imported from the old homes, manufactured in marble workshops that produced and exported specific motifs? Well, these two monuments were discovered in a city called Apollonia in the Western Black Sea, and for both of them, 
we find numerous comparison in the eastern and then even also in the northern Mediterranean. But when we take a closer look at these, we can see that while they definitely share similarities, there are not two of them that look exactly the same. And until today, it is difficult to pinpoint an undisputed place of origin. Now, sometimes these monuments also carry inscriptions, like this gravestone, which was discovered at Kume, which is a, which is a city um, close to modern-day Izmir at the western coast of Turkey. Now, the upper inscription was written in a Parian dialect, and it says that the artist who produced this beautiful thing, as it states, came from the island of Paros. The lower inscription was designed in a Samian alphabet and dialect, and it identifies the father of the deceased as a person who came from Samos. So what we can see here is that both commissioners and producers of such works actively engaged in super-regional networks, in a super-regional identity. But did such images also impress beyond the scopes of these Greek settlements? Did they inspire Scythians to produce sculpture as well? Again, it seems they didn't. First transfers of motifs and styles can be detected elsewhere, in their prime image carriers, in metalwares, and it also seems that Near Eastern motifs, like mythical beasts, were more appealing to the Scythians than, for instance, the display of the human figure. Only in a second stage, and in particular places and in under particular circumstances, we can see these patterns changing. In the Northern Black Sea, we can observe that from the 5th, 4th centuries BCE, Greek settlements became more and more involved in the production of prestigious metal items met to meet Scythian needs. And maybe it's because of this increased cooperation that we can now also detect changes in the visual languages. We can see interrelations between their different prime image carriers. There are many ways to display as Sphinx. And it's quite remarkable that they use the same concept here for a large marble sculpture and a figure vase, which were discovered in a Greek context, in the Greek settlements, as for this set of ear pendants, which decorated or adorned the female deceased in a lavish Scythian burial. And eventually, we can also see that the human figure was introduced into images that were used in Scythian contexts. But it wasn't standardized Greek motifs that we find. These are Scythians. They're characterized by their voluminous hair, their long beards, their leather and pelt jackets, trousers, and their Scythian weaponry. And in very rare cases, we can also see that monumental sculpture became used in Scythian contexts. This monumental relief was discovered in a um, tumulus at the Crimea. It adorned the tumulus. And while it does contain some Greek elements, like the building that we can see in the background of the main figure, a woman, many of its main iconographic features, like the woman herself, clearly have other roots. They correspond, and that's very interesting, they correspond to the way the female deceased was dressed with the diadem and the whale. And we can see the image of the woman. We find her in many other Scythian burials too, very often on dress adornments. Who was this woman? Was she a deity? Did she refer to the deceased? Is she a deified deceased? We do not know. But even though we do not always understand these images, they do open windows for us. Windows to concepts that we have no texts that wouldn't inform us about. 
um, cultural and contexts between Greeks and non-Greeks have often been approached with general narratives. The concept of colonization, which assumes that Greeks came to new places and Hellenized their surroundings. But these are modern perceptions and they are mainly based on literary sources. Exploring the wider range of our communication still doesn't tell us how things were. But we can add a few pieces to our jigsaw puzzle. And as tiny as they may be, they contribute to an image of the past that does more justice to the complexity of phenomena like migration. And they also remind us that phenomena like migration primarily involve and affect individuals. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>